Do you want to know the seemingly little tiny things that we can do in sales and business to have huge success? Then this episode is for you. Hello, Sales Nation, and welcome to today's episode of the Sales Man Podcast. On today's show, we have Mary Browning. She is the Director of Sales Development over at Amplify.com. And on today's show, we're diving into the small things that have a huge impact on us hitting targets as sales professionals. We dive into the internal things of how you essentially can get into Mary's good books as a real sales practitioner, and then the external things of how you can get into the good books and win business with new customers. And so with all that said, let's jump straight into the conversation. Mary, welcome to the Salesman Podcast. Well, thank you so much for having me. You're well, they're welcome. Glad to have you on. So we're going to dive into uh, the title, the topic, the context here of the small things that make a big difference in sales and business. And I want to cover both the, I want to leverage you as a real practitioner here and cover perhaps some of the small things that us sales reps can do for you that gets us in your good books. And then I want to focus more so on the customer side of things of the small things we can do for the customers that make a huge difference to them. So open-ended question here, because I don't want to kind of put words in your mouth and lead you in one direction or another, but what are the, say, two, three biggest leveraged, uh, that's almost an oxymoron of, biggest leverage small things that we can do to make a big difference? Fantastic uh, question, Will. You know, I started to think about um, my experience as a sales individual and, and my learning process. Um, this uh, mindset kind of came very naturally t- uh, for me, um, really when I was in instances of my career where potentially the performance or the results weren't exactly where I wanted them to be. And um, I think in today's world for sales, that happens for two different reasons. One, it happens because there's either not enough information or number two, it happens because there's way too much information. So um, as uh, as everyday practitioners, as we try to tackle that, um, it can be really difficult and can be very overwhelming to identify what's the one thing in this scenario that I need to do to, to really change the end goal. And, um, and so that's kind of where my mindset um, really was born in terms of this kind of philosophy and approach. And it's important to me because I think it has such an impact on attitude, which will, as you know, is one of the most important things that uh, has to be in line for a salesperson to succeed. So um, anyway, I know that that, that kind of gave you a little bit of a background in terms of um, you know, why I think it's so important and where I see that having the biggest impact. Um, but back to your question, I think the number one area that's had the biggest impact on my sales career um, that is quite small is remember to be human. And um, I'm a I'm a very process orientated person. Uh, people who work with me and my team would tell you that sometimes I can get really stuck on the how do we get from A to D and the really the, the specific steps it takes to get there. And in doing that, you can get a little bit over processized, if, if that's a word. I made that up. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and in doing that, you can lose some of that uh, human aspect that is so important. Um, for us in sales today, um, I think prospects have a uh, a meter right now where they're looking for instances where we sound like salespeople and 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 it, it's tougher for us to kind of get to the end goal when that happens. So that's probably one of the number one things. I've got something that is not to do with sales, but will the audience will enjoy this. Of I and the audience know this as well. Super process driven, and so I had a real brainstorming session with a few mentors uh, over Skype. We had a kind of four way conversation. People have really. Uh, built huge audiences are doing really well at the moment and I was essentially going through my process that I'd planned to grow the show and it involved lots of what you did described of going from point A to B then B to C C to D and going to grow this platform I'm going to do ad spend on this and the conclusion after me rabbiting on for about seven or eight minutes to all of them was you just need to go and guest on more podcasts people like listening to you people like it when you go off on rants and that is dynamite for to be on other people's shows. And it's essentially a similar conclusion of what you just described then of just being human. It wasn't have the four steps of growing your social media platform as this, do this image five times, do this, do X, Y, Z. It was just get yourself out there and just be on more podcasts. And it was as simple as that. And it, this blew my mind because as I said, I'm, I'm process driven as well. And I think in sales, I, in the past, I've been overly process driven. And now when I'm selling ad space on the show, 
when I'm dealing with Salesforce, for example, at the moment, I'm going back and forth with Kevin a whole bunch over there. And he, I know he listened to the show, so that will hopefully put a smile on his face. That I'm giving him a shout out. But it's just having a conversation with him. You strip all the nonsense away, the motives. We've both got the same goal that we're trying to achieve. And we're both moving forward in the same direction. And a lot of what he's doing with the quotable.com blog as well has similar um, kind of end goals that I have with the show. And so there's real alignment there. We're just just chatting, have a conversation, then talking a lot of marketing. And he's giving me loads of feedback. I'm trying to give him some feedback as well. And then the the deal, the sales conversation comes in the last five minutes of the phone call. Uh, what I want to kind of go out with this, Mary, is are we overcomplicating the whole selling process? And is it almost as simple as get in front of people, be yourself and just have a great conversation with them and do that enough and that will close deals. Um, so I think that's a great story that you shared, shared, excuse me, in an answer to your question. Yes, I do think, and I'm guilty of this, there's definitely times where we try to overthink it and, and make it more complicated than it, than it is. Um, I, uh, in a previous life, I spent a lot of time working with clients um, where we were going in and um, basically instituting their prospecting program and, and just going through that process. Um, you know, number one, you're, you're kind of just inundated with um, everything that's in front of you in terms of the process within our organization. But um, as you know, there's also outside kind of this uh, blinking light that's always going on and saying, remember, you've got to do this in a digital fashion. You've got to be doing social and, and all these things. And all those, the, although those are important, I don't want to minimize the importance of those. It can just get extremely overwhelming. And because we're dealing with people, they feel that. And um, I've definitely been on calls where I could feel my shoulders rising because I was overcomplicating it. And most likely the prospect felt the same way. So I definitely think that just based on how we're inundated as sales professionals and people that are always trying to get better, it's very easy to overcomplicate it. And there's so many times where I'm, I'm just saying, Mary, go back to the basics, start there, go back to being Mary. And, and I see the results in a much different light. So I want to dive into how we can be more human. And that'll be a theme for this episode, I'm sure. But there's something that you said, and I don't want to gloss over it. And I think that had real impact. And it was, I think it was like the second or third line that came out of your mouth at the top of the show, Mary. And that was the one thing to change that really affects our end goal. Is this something that we should be looking at in sales of what's the biggest leverage point that we have at the moment? And then focusing all in on that versus doing what you just kind of described of it's got to be social, it's got to be multimedia, it's got to be video, we've got to now do video emails, even though the written emails are doing fine. Should we just focus this down and simplify the whole sales process of what's the one, excuse me, what's the one platform that we're, the, the customer's excited about and just double down on that? Yes, I, I do think so. The only caveat, Will, that I would add to that is um, although it's it's also important to be thinking about how do we innovate, um, I think it's more important about how the process to do that. So I'll give a really quick example. Um, here at Amplify, we're actually getting ready for our quarterly meeting for this afternoon. And um, you know, I'm, I'm working and looking at um, our sales group as a whole and uh, looking to identify what's gonna take us to the next level. So you know, the first piece process-wise to that is um, is looking at the metrics, which I won't dive into unless you'd like me. But um, the first piece is really looking at the metrics and um, and figuring out where we want to go. And um, part of what um, my my sales partner and I really talked about is we want to continue to move our team towards the direction of becoming a world class sales organization. And so that does take you know, being open and trying to understand what are the things that are innovative outside of our process that we're not doing today. Um, and I'll say you know, one of those key things um, for us is um, using video in our prospecting process. And um, it's something that we haven't tackled quite yet. A lot of organizations are getting into it and it's, it's a new exciting way to kind of reach potential customers. Um, but opposed to kind of jumping in and saying, by the end of the quarter, we need to have every single one of our reps using video. It's we're going to test it on one campaign and we're going to probably test it with one person um, so that they can get really good in that scenario. And um, and once we go through that exercise 
and have tested it, we can scale it. But it but does start very simply. That's just, that's the only thing for the quarter when it comes to video that we're doing. So I think it's also trying to find the really small baby step things that you can do that will have major big impact. And my hope is we run that exercise and we see that we can you know double or triple conversion rates and then we can scale it. But that's kind of an example of I think how we need to look at it. I guess perhaps leverage you and you here as a practitioner in the space, Mary. For us salespeople, the B2B salespeople who are listening to the show, is experimenting with, for example, I mean, this is a really good example because it's, it's really useful. And I'm sure you're going to find great success in video emails. Is that something that we should do ourselves as salespeople, see if it works and then feed it back to you? Or do you want to have control over that process? And I always use the, um, the, the cliche of I'd rather ask for forgiveness rather than permission on a lot of this stuff. But I was also a pain in the ass person to manage and I appreciate that. <laughs> and now managing a, a group of creatives as well who are working uh, behind the scenes with the podcast, it, I can understand how stressful it is and difficult it is to manage someone who is a pain. But then there's potential upsides to that as well. Is that something that, you know, not particularly, not necessarily just that specific example, but should we be at the forefront, the B2B salespeople, the people in the field, should we be at the forefront of innovation and pushing things forward? Or again, go back to the, the previous question, should we be just focusing on what we know works and allowing kind of like sales leadership to feed down and trickle ideas into us uh, when when they feel the time is right? So I think there's a really beautiful balance that has to exist there. Um, the one thing I love about working with salespeople, and I'm getting your like this too, with, with this um, just amazing podcast um, nation that you've built, it's innovative, it's new, so that's awesome. So, you know, I do think that um, as we look at ourselves as salespeople, we're also very good at um, kind of bringing ourselves out of the process and thinking about what can I do specifically to, to control this scenario better um, and, and reach my prospect in a, in, in a more, you know, aggressive or, you know, more succinct way, whatever it is. So, um, so I, I, again, there's a balance. Um, I love working with salespeople because many of them have those ideas um, and are, are willing to outside of just some of the day-to-day -day, um, calls and meetings that they have to start to make some traction towards some of that. Um, I, uh, you know, I, I think back to um, myself when I was um, early in my career, and it was very common for me to start to try to think of um, what can I do to get this um, prospect through the process more efficiently and faster and how can I decrease cost of acquisitions and I had a lot of ideas like that and um, although I wasn't um, taking time in a silo to um, to try something new and and integrate it implement it through the entire process what I was doing was raising some of those things to leadership um, to say you know based on the environment that we're in with sales this is something we need to we really need to try and I would love to to be kind of the guinea pig and working on it. And, you know, by that point, it enables salespeople to um, look outside just their day to day, um, which I think is very necessary in terms of attitude. So to look outside their day to day to be innovative, but to also get some of that leadership buy in. I think two minds are always better than one, especially when they're both really good salespeople. Um, so I think it is kind of a really nice blend there. Um, and I have team members that are doing this from here, here at Amplify, um, and video is actually one of those things that came out of a team member's idea. And part of the fun process of sales is investing in something like that and getting someone bought into, let's try this and see what happens. Does that answer your question? It does. And I'm intrigued here. Is there a trend between the top sales people within you know, your team other teams and how much time they spend thinking about innovation because this could go either way they could be the top sales people because they know what works they do it and they're ruthless and they dive into it and they focus all the time on it i know that i was always a b player because i was trying to and it works great as an entrepreneur it doesn't work great as a salesperson of i was always trying to hack the system i was always trying to find better ways of doing it when perhaps if i just knuckled down i would have had more success so is there a trend of how the top performing salespeople think about sales of, are they just focused on what works, getting on with it, or are they the innovators? Mm, fantastic question. Um, and I probably have a blurry answer for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's, <laughs> I'm, I'm talking I, about your experience yeah. here as opposed to like data, yeah. I guess. 
Absolutely. Um, so in my experience, um, my, um, my top performers are a blend of both. Um, and I think it's a really interesting question because there's also, uh, you know, I th- I've had many conversations with sales professionals around the balance of, um, does it really come down to only looking at the day-to-day activities that are being done or is it the mindset of, uh, I need to make sure that in every activity that I'm doing, it's to get the most meetings, it's to close the most deals. And I will say that in my past, I've been very activity driven. So this goes back to me being process orientated, that it comes down to this many calls a day and and the uh, regimented nature around that. And I definitely had top performers where there were workhorses. They came in, they were just, they were focused on the numbers and and they produced and they did very, very well. Um, now, on the other side, um, I've had team members that um, focus a little bit more on innovation, and they're challenging me um, in, in this role as well. And when, when I talk about that, I'm talking about teams specifically who amplify, and they've challenged my belief on uh, on the activity driven side because you can do a lot of activities and still have a day that isn't great. And you know, part of um, what what I'm working to do with uh, with the team here that's been really exciting is try to change our mindset around what makes a good day. And at the end of the day, a good day is one in which we're booking a lot of meetings, we're pushing deals through the process, we're closing, you know, we're doing those key and tactical things. And I'm looking for some different ways to measure that across the team because I've also seen top performers thrive with that type of setup. And so uh, this is actually specifically with our prospecting team, uh, so the folks that are cold calling. And what we're testing right now is as opposed to just measuring calls per day and conversations and follow-ups, um, we're, we're starting to kind of measure those all evenly. We're starting to measure those a little bit differently. So booking a meeting has way more points than how many calls you make. So it, it allows some freedom for a rep who wants to try a different email uh, to a prospect or um, has a follow up and wants to be more creative with it. So it allows for some of that because we're really we're changing our focus now on the end goal. Is there any way to measure people's attitudes or even just how happy they are? Because I bet if you had someone cold calling, they made 30 calls and they're really happy. They're having a great day. They're going to have more success than someone who's just been dumped and is having a really miserable day. And then they spilt coffee on the trousers in the morning and uh, they look ridiculous. Is there any way to measure that from like a management perspective? Because clearly that has a huge impact on, uh, you know, not necessarily activity, but the results of the activity. It does. Absolutely. Um, You know, I think part of it, um, and this is going to be an interesting answer for me because Amplify does employee engagement, so which is kind of the direction that we're going from an attitude um, perspective. I definitely have my Amplify answer, and I've got my <laughs> manager answer. Um, but I, um, you know, when I when I look at the uh, interactions that I have with team members on, say, a one-to-one basis. So for reps, this is looking at the time that I do have with uh, management. Um, make sure you've got a manager who's cued in um, to some of those things. Um, so, uh, we've got kind of a neat setup for our one-on-one meetings with, um, individual reps where the first 15 minutes is entirely on them. It's on whatever they want to talk about and whatever they want to bring to the table. And part of what, um, I'm working to do in that instance is, um, is just kind of get a pulse check for how they're feeling and how things are going. And the, um, I look across my team, the conversations um, that I'm having that are, I'm a little burnt out, I'm, I'm behind my goal or not exactly where I want to be, um, are those people where I'm, I'm also sometimes pushing for um, volume of calls. So, you know, there's uh, there's definitely ways to do it um, that are more like survey driven. I really try to do that one on one. So as a rep, make sure you're getting that from your manager. How honest when we get a question like that of how, how are you feeling, how are you doing, and perhaps we're slightly behind target, perhaps we're feeling that bit of stress. How honest should we be with our sales leadership? This seems like an odd question to ask, but I know to give context, I've been in scenarios before where I've essentially lied to a sales manager to get them off my back because I know there was a big deal coming in a few months down the line that was going to wrap everything up and, and make me hit target for the year. So I'd just lie to his face just to kind of get him away from me. So that is, you know, there's an element of me being a poor 
um, kind of employee and him being a poor manager, not being able to break through this. I'm sure. So it's, you know, 50, 50 or however you want to describe it. But from your perspective, how honest, um, and not, and I guess, take your employees out the scenario out here for a second, perhaps, but how honest should they be? How these fictitious employees, how honest should they be with you? You know, cause you're there to help them. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I encourage um, pretty transparent honesty, especially as it relates to sales individuals. So um, as I mentioned earlier um, on the call, um, uh, sorry, not on the call, on this show, yeah, that'll be a part you edit. <laughs> as I mentioned earlier in the podcast, um, attitude is such a massive thing for sales. And there's been several instances where, you know, I found that things should have gone better, but because of how I felt internally or what was maybe going on around that, it had such a major impact on performance. So although there's instances where um, the manager has to um, has to find a way to um, kind of look at each person and see where from where they're sitting and where they're coming from, it is better for a rep to be honest about those things that they're feeling where they're getting challenged, where they're frustrated, because it has such an impact on how they're going to deliver as a salesperson. I know looking back at my last kind of couple of sales roles, I feel it was an immaturity in me that just made me lie to get rid of them. Whereas what really would have happened if I'd been open and honest about it, I probably would have got a rollick in that, you know, you'd you'd aligned your pipeline up wrong and you'd you'd set it up so you're gonna close loads of deals at the end of the year rather than like lay them out flat. But it's almost like a lie then. Well, it's, it's literally like a lie. It is literally a lie. Once you've told it, then you've got to build this story around it and you've got to keep it up and it goes on and on and on versus just dealing with the fact that your pipeline is skewed or that you're having a poor year, that you're struggling. It allows them to help you then. And so I encourage the audience to kind of take that on board if uh, they've got sales managers chasing them. That minute or two of pain where they look at you with a kind of weird look of, hey, this is not the place that we thought we were this uh, this point of the year. That's probably worth the kind of support that they can give you after the fact. Because clearly, you know, everyone's targets are all aligned with this, aren't they? Yes. And I, I could not agree more. Um, and I, you know, I think back a little bit to a point in my career where I was in that stage of feeling burnt out. And, um, you know, originally I was, it's, it's, it's fine. I can handle this. I've got it on my own. And a, a great mentor um, looked at me and said, Mary, it's your job <laughs> to be able to communicate some of those things so you can get to a better spot. Um, and then you're going to do better for the company and you're going to do better in terms of the goals that you're doing. So couldn't agree more. Great point. Well, so putting this back onto the customer for a second here, Mary, how important are all the little things that seemingly we don't always put the most importance on in that, uh, you know, quick responses to emails and phone calls, uh, accurate responses to emails and phone calls rather than just a rushed email to get them off your back. How important are those things versus coming up with a big complex plan of giving them loads of value? How do they stack up kind of as we go forward day to day uh, with our communications with customers? That's a, a really good question, Will. And I think one that's worth spending a little bit of time on um, because we are still inundated by all the things we should be doing as salespeople. Um, but it, it does go back, you know, one of the first things I said is it goes back to being human. Also goes back to just being professional. Um, and the example that I like to use specifically um, with that is, is how you're handling the follow-ups um, or the, the people that you're nurturing through your sales process. Um, and I, I, my opinion is actually sales um, individuals don't put quite enough effort around those, but those are the ones that pay off. Those are your money. Um, and so they, it, it's, it's, uh, it's smart for us to make sure that we're, we're handling those with, uh, with kid gloves. So what's the difference here, Mary? Sorry to interrupt. What's the difference between someone who is not putting effort, effort in and someone who is putting enough effort in? What, what's the differences? What does, that, what does it look like? So that we can identify with it uh, specifically with um, that's probably something I said there. Uh, so specific effort in terms of the oh the follow-ups. So yeah. sorry, gotcha. Um, yes. Yeah, so um, uh, so follow-ups and when we look at kind of the the follow-up and the differences that I see in reps, um, the individuals that are putting enough effort on say follow-ups in their uh, pipeline are ones that are doing a very good job at the end of that call to establish next steps and get buy-in around next steps. Um, and then what reps are doing at the beginning of that next call 
um, to set up a strong agenda and to make sure we're really clear about the things that um, were discussed in that last call um, and particularly partic in particular say um, what were the things that were maybe still up in the air so it's it's really a tension at kind of the bookends um, of those two calls is is where I, I would say yep that person put a lot of extra effort um, that will pay off for them um, those that don't um, are, are maybe putting more attention in the middle of the call where they're talking about um, product features um, as opposed to just getting really good at um, all right mr. prospect on this call we covered off these three things next time we talk here's the things that we're going to talk about there's this piece that we still need to figure out mutually together um, and we'll do that in the next call you good with that fantastic and then making sure we're starting the call like that as well um, so there's a lot of time that goes in between follow-ups like that and it's very easy to jump back on and say hey I'm going back into presentation mode here's how cool Amplify is and, and we miss those two pieces um, so specifically, I also see that in prospecting where follow-ups get logged and um, it's the day you're due to call them back and you push it out a day and that has a big impact too just on uh, being able to see good return from it. I see this in the context and we talked about it quite recently of buyers don't always know how to buy. We are selling constantly. We're on these calls all the time. You might do three or four of the same call a day. And so for you to drop off that either end because you've had a similar conversation a few times might make sense in the, not the lazy part of your brain, but the part of your brain that's going, let's do the minimum, minimum amount of efforts to get the best result um, versus that buyer has only had that conversation with you once. So that's how I like to frame it up in my mind of those little uh, book stands either side of the conversation. I, I, again, I forget to do it sometimes. When I'm doing these calls, I'm selling the advertiser space on the podcast. And it's because I've had the same conversation three or four times this week. Um, but do you think this is something that we should focus on as sales professionals in that buyers, you know, it's different if you're dealing with a procurement officer, but if you're dealing with a CMO, C, uh, you know, CFO, head of HR, whoever it is, they may not be as acutely used to going through this process as what we perhaps give them credit for. Is that something that we should focus on? Yeah, I do think so, and and um, part of it is um, working to get to the emotional stage that they're at as well. Um, so uh, one thing that comes up quite a bit um, just from a prospecting standpoint is we have team members that pitch, you know, I don't know, 20 to 30 times a day. So the first one is um, is it has a little bit more emotion, has a little bit more descriptors, but that last one. Sounds like we've said it a million times and that salesperson <laughs> certainly knows it. Um, and um, and I do think that comes back to um, just uncertainty of, of, of how to buy. Um, buyers are definitely overwhelmed with um, the marketing emails that are coming out and the call and the phone calls that they're getting um, as, as we're looking to test video. Um, you know, I, I remember maybe the first two providers who reached out to me and now I've got like one a day, you know, so, so recognizing that, um, our prospects are, are definitely, um, overwhelmed with data today, um, means we have to think about it differently. And, and it's another one of those small things to do to get very large impact that is outside of process and how I run a call, but is just, okay. I'm saying this to this prospect for the very first time. Let me emotionally be cued into that, and that will have a bigger impact on the call than uh, effort that you can focus on somewhere else. Love it. This comes back to this idea of just being human. And I know when, so I let the audience pitch me, and uh, it's always refreshing for me when they ask me, not how are you, and I know it's part of a script, they go, you know, how is you and how is the car or how is the podcast coming? And it's that extra three, four words within the sentence that allow me to give them a real answer versus the British answer, which is like, yeah, I'm, I'm okay. The American answer might be, yeah, I'm great. And there's probably <laughs> obvious, obvious stereotypes which come into that as well. But uh, this is interesting because if you do get that British answer of I'm great, but the weather's shit, you're, you're immediately dimming the 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 pace, the energy, the emotion in the conversation, which you've got to then build back up to get them to a point where they're going to be able to take action on a next step or closing the deal, whatever it is. It's interesting. I never really thought about this, um, but there probably is a difference between speaking regularly to 
people in different markets just from the fact that they pick up the phone and they're probably more <laughs> more uh, optimistic or pessimistic than than other potential markets but digressing there slightly mary i want to bring this back into the internal in a company world what little things can we do as sales reps to get in your good books either as one off occasions or what are the regular things that kind of get you annoyed i guess that people aren't doing them promptly or correctly enough Oh gosh, great question. There's a few things that come to mind <laughs> on that. Um, yeah, let me think about that for a second. So um, I'm a process-driven person, as I mentioned, and I think a lot of um, a lot of management uh, team members are as well. So, um, you know, I have a precedence with my team still around, say, um, dials and number of calls that we're making per day. Um, I tend to get a little bit annoyed when um, when it's every day we're hitting just the bare minimum of that. Um, and uh, I think part of what's just fantastic to see, and um, and this instance is one where I'm more inclined to um, invest in an individual, is I'm going to make it a goal that this week, instead of making uh, 50 calls, I'm going to make 55 a day. So just five more. So that's one example of just something very small that shows um, work ethic and willing to kind of go the extra mile. Um, the second thing um, is uh, just some of those reps that go in and get very in motion with the process. Um, and we've talked a lot about being human and using innovation through the through, through the process. And um, although I've seen very good reps that come in work and leave, um, it, uh, it, although that person is successful, there's still, there's still a gap there. There's still the, the question of, is this an individual that's going to be able to bring, um, the sales organization where I want it to go? And so I look for those things. So, you know, when, when, when you're a rep and you get a good idea about how the process should, should change or this new innovative thing that we're going to try, talk about it, bring it up, share your ideas. Um, because it's those things that make a world-class organization when we see them from, um, from individuals, but it's also something that makes sales a ton more fun, um, a little bit less of a burnout, a little bit less of a grind. Um, so that would be the other small, uh, small piece. Um, the last thing I'll say, Will, because I think this is really important for reps that are out there and grinding and maybe aren't getting the results that they like to see. Um, it's very easy, and I've done this myself, to um, as a salesperson, um, when I'm not getting what I want, my first step is to go figure out why. So I'm talking to mentors, I'm talking to my boss, I'm you know listening to shows like this, I'm reading articles, and then I start to go, I, I basically go and try to change everything. And it's 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 not the mindset of I suck at cold calling. It's I, I probably suck at this one area of it, um, and and work to bring clarity to that for yourself. So that um, instead of in reinventing the entire wheel, focus on just that one spoke. So I know I threw three kind of big examples at you there, but those are probably the ones that stand out to me the most. Is the last one accountability and responsibility? Is that a trait that you're looking for in your in your reps? In that they perhaps because I've suck, I've I've never really done cold calling. I've always been in fortunate positions where selling to surgeons and procurement officers and people like that with the NHS, they want me to be there because I was oversold at the best kind of like products in that space. So the surgeons wanted to play with all the new toys. So I've never had to really cold call. Um, and this is something that I've talked about on the show before. And it's something that behind the scenes, I might be going doing a little bit of it and making some YouTube content of me sucking at it and um, le learning the ropes and getting uh, some context of it for future conversations on the podcast. So with that in mind, is, is, as you said, if someone sucks at cold calling, do you want to see them do more dials or do you want to see them spend the last half an hour of an afternoon with someone who's really good at cold calling and just listening in perhaps to the conversations and, and trying to get a bit of mentoring from them? Um, so I think it depends on where they are in their process. Um, so for brand new reps, my biggest thing is get on the phone and get comfortable dialing. That's the number one thing. Start there. And I want you to make a lot of calls. And because it's going to be harder to um, sit with someone and glean some of that important information when you haven't lived and breathed it yourself. And so part of that is um, I tell my reps, um, start making calls. I want to see this many a day. And I want to see you mess up half of them. And then I want to talk to you about them. 
Um, so also just giving that freedom that the faster we um, mess up on something like cold calling, the faster we're going to get. Now, after that time period where uh, reps are much more comfortable on the phone, they're also comfortable messing up and finding a way to be human and interact with the prospect than on the line. Um, then it's OK, now that we've gotten this background, um, definitely save an hour of your day um, to go talk to this top performer or um, this sales leader, or whoever it might be, to start to glean some of those things. And then coming out of those conversations, what I'm looking for is now what's the one thing you're going to work on? Instead of the 15 things you learned in that process, pick <laughs> the one thing. Um, and then for a week, focus on that. And that's where just the learning starts to become um, just empowering. And um, you start to see definitely improvements in specific areas and kind of taking that approach. And we'll wrap up with this, Mary, but on cold calling specifically, and we've got a whole bunch, as, as kind of alluded to, we've got a whole bunch of content coming up on that in the next few months. How much of cold calling success is just you, it's not even confidence, just you being comfortable to have a conversation with someone that you don't know and you can't see? How much of it comes from just your comfort zone is bigger than the fact that you're having a conversation with some a random person on the phone? A lot, a lot. And <laughs> and I'll also say that the hardest thing to do um, is pick up that first phone, phone call. That's the hardest part. Um, and after that, um, you start to find your own way. And it's also... Um, if I can, if my mindset is always, how do I do this tactic my way? It becomes just significantly easier. And you start to build that confidence up as well, which is so evident, um, when you can't see somebody. Um, and, um, so yeah, even just having the confidence to, ch to challenge somebody on the phone. So yeah, it's huge. I can't say enough how huge that is. And we focus a lot on that, um, and make sure that, um, you're, if you're starting cold calling and very, from the very beginning, make sure you focus on the confidence piece and that specifically is how do i take this tactic or strategy and make it my own love it i think if i was to go back in sales i'd probably want to be in your organization of you know 50 calls a day as opposed to you know there's some out there that uh it was i said your call center at that point of 400 you know, auto dial auto, auto, for 12 hours in a row so but i think there'd be huge advantage for me to learn how to cold call because i think it would increase my comfort zone dramatically even now i get nervous sometimes being on the phone with people if it's an important call um, but I think, yeah, I think that would be, I think for anyone who's listening, who wants a career in sales, that SDR role, that kind of first uh, setup meeting call, you know, perhaps how you're describing here with your team, that's probably the best place I'd recommend they would start. Um, and with that, Mary, I've got one question to ask everyone that comes on the show. And that is, if you could go back in time and speak to your younger self, what would be the one piece of advice you'd give her to help her become better at selling? Um, it would be just to simplify it and remember that um, there's a, just a process behind it. So I, I, I hope that resonates with you too, Will, as you're a process oriented person too. If I have a process and a methodology, then I can tackle anything and sales is the same way. Um, it can be overwhelming because you're working so hard to get um, an individual who's on one side of the fence, like totally to the other side. So it feels overwhelming. It feels like you have to push and prod. And that sounds terrible. And it's not about that at all. It's um, it's just reminding that simply it's a process that I'm going to help people move through to be able to understand their pains and their problems a little bit better. Um, and then mutually see if if my product or service can help. So um, that, that's really simply what it is. And um, just giving myself the, um, the confidence behind that and um, and, and just gleaning a lot of empowerment from it. Amazing stuff. I find that a lot of the things that are seemingly complex, and these are the, some of the things that interest me the most of how to lift someone's emotions up and all the psychology and all the, when we have people come on to talk about NLP and all this good stuff, they're all somewhat weird manipulation tactics, really, when you drill them down. But you don't have to do any of that if you believe your product's good, you want to just have a great conversation with someone. That's how I simplify a lot of this of, I just want to really help this individual. And you have to look at it again from a, a high level perspective of if they don't want help, then this is just one of the phone calls that you described that you've messed up and you've learned from and your comfort zone's got that little bit bigger. And I think as soon as you frame it like that, I, that just changes the game for me completely. Um, and with that, Mary, I'm, uh, <laughs> this, I could dive into a whole bunch more of this, especially on the cold calling side with you. Um, but tell us a little bit about Empify and then tell us where we can find out more about you as well. 
Absolutely. Um, so Amplify right now, so on the sales development side, um, we are hiring. So we're very excited about bringing in some people um, that we can invest in and um, just really help them along the process of the sales journey. Um, so specifically, um, we work with companies on the um, HR and CEO and president side um, with employee engagement as a whole. So um, specifically, uh, clients will come to us when they've maybe tried a lot of things for employee engagement, but they can't quite put their finger on why maybe they still have disengaged people or they have conflict that they can't control. So um, we come in from a measurement perspective to, to help you pinpoint exactly why um, from an employee engagement perspective. We've got 14 drivers of engagement that we track. Um, we actually partnered with Butler University out here in Indianapolis to identify some of these so that uh, leaders within an organization can get to the point of really understanding what's occurring um, that w in terms of why my people aren't engaged and what can I do about it? And we work with you specifically um, on that front. So um, because it sounds a little fuzzy, um, it can it can mean that it's a, um, it's a difficult uh, sales process and, and just trying to get tangible with it. So that also means we have to be highly sophisticated on the sales development side. So our mission is to, um, is to really grow individuals to be budding sales uh, people and sales leaders and so um, just based on how our product is and our process it enables us to do that extremely well. Um, so uh, we love to chat more with anybody on the topic um, or, or share more um, specifically with the company. We're at Amplify.com, E-M-P-L-I-F-Y. Um, in terms of getting in touch with me, I am um, on social media. Best way is probably LinkedIn, um, which is just Mary Browning. I'm also on Twitter as Mary B. Jolly, J-O-L-L-Y, which is my maiden name. Um, and uh, it's probably the best way to get in touch with me if you have more questions. I love talking to women in business. Um, it's uh, it's always been just a fascinating area for me as, as being female, but um, also seeing just what um, accomplishment and achievement could do for, for women out there and within just our, our global uh, women business organization. So another thing I love to talk about. Amazing stuff. Well, I'll link to all of that in the show notes to this episode over at salesandpodcast.com. And with that, Mary, I want to thank you for your time. I want to thank you for kind of how to describe it being there as a sales practitioner and giving back to my audience here. And then I really appreciate the fact that you're the first person to come on who is a sales leader who's recruiting and using our platform to you know get hopefully to some of the, the top performers within this space. So kudos on that. And uh, I want to thank you for joining us again on the Sales and Podcast. Thank you so much, Will. It was a blast. Appreciate it.